slippers to satellite. Um, and this is something that's arising out of you know, the was interesting about the portrayal of Africa as our, our brothers, but I mean, it's now a root to become a global super, superpower as it's, it's um, long term entrenchment into Africa. Um, Lindsay Hilson is also a journalist, like Sharon, but um, she works for ITN. She's now the international editor of Channel 4 News, but very, until very recently, she was the China correspondent for Channel 4 News based in, in Beijing. But she has reported from all over the world and has won many awards for her foreign reporting. Um, <laughs> And when she was um, in the oration for her honorary doctorate at the University of Essex, she was described as a, a modern Martha Gell. <laughs> <laughs> that's, very, that's very flattering, I must say. Um, and I should also say that, that I, I lived in Africa for quite a while and spent quite a, a long time there, but I have been in China for the, for the last couple of years. And um, what, I, I spent a bit of time in Beijing hanging out with, with an African football team called Africa United, which is the only all-African team in the Beijing Amateur League. And uh, they're made up of African young businessmen and uh, students. They can't see me over there. Do you want me to stand up? Okay, you can't see me. I can see you from how I normally do. Um, yeah, I, think I spent a bit of time in, when I was living in China hanging out with a football team called Africa United um, who were made up of um, young professionals, businessmen, students and so on. And they were all highly motivated and intelligent as you can imagine. And living in China was boggling their minds. Um, there was a, an Ethiopian called Sam who had been in prison in Ethiopia because he'd been fighting for democracy and eventually he went into exile, married a Finnish woman, ended up in China. And we used to have long chats and said, you know all this democracy business? I'm not so sure about it, now I live in China. And we stood on the football field and looked around all the huge buildings and the new bridge being built and said, you know, in a Western country they'd never get that bridge built, would they? Because of planning permission and this and that. And then there'd be somebody saying, oh, that abuses our human rights to have that bridge there and so on. He said, but China, they just get on with it. He said, we need a bit of that in Africa. <laughs> yeah, we really could do with that. He said, I'm beginning, you know, and he was beginning to rethink the whole way he had, he had looked at development because of the experience he was having in China. And I found many of the young Africans I met were, were looking at that and thinking, well, why can't we do this? Why can't we do what China's done? Why can't we develop this fast? I'm beginning to have profound doubts about the whole Western agenda of good governance, democracy, endless damn elections, um, which pit people against each other. He was beginning to really question things. And I had, and at that point I was also, I was beginning to have a lot of sympathy because I could see why he could feel that the progress that China had made was a real example and a real model. But then over the time I lived in China, I began to look at things a little bit differently because I began to see how, how China was also learning from Africa and finding some things quite hard to learn. There's no information in China is, is basically controlled by the government. So whereas here you would get all sorts of different information from Africa, you'd get you know, what the development department says, you'd get what the foreign office says, but you'd also get what journalists say and what NGOs say and what human rights groups say, all these different versions of events. In China there's really only one version of events because there's no, there are no Chinese NGOs working in Africa. There aren't that many working in China. There aren't Chinese human rights workers. There, aren't, there isn't a different perspective coming, it's only the government perspective. And what that means is that when quite a lot of Chinese business people get to Africa, they're rather surprised. Because it isn't all brotherly friendship and everything the way it should be. And a lot of Chinese businesses are now starting to complain that they, they don't really know what's going on. And because everything is described, any problem is described as humanitarian, not political. So what's happening in Sudan is a humanitarian problem. It's not politics, it's certainly not genocide. What happened in Kenya last year after the elections, when there, when there was murder and mayhem, that wasn't described as a political problem, that was described as a humanitarian problem. Well that actually, if you willfully misunderstand what's going on. That makes it very hard to do business. A friend of mine, um, who will be familiar to many people on the panel, called, called Hu Wenping, who's a, a Chinese academic who works in Africa, describes me how in Nigeria, um, during the election, 
she knew Chinese managers who just stayed in their hotel the whole time because they were so terrified, because they didn't understand that lots of screaming and shouting and jumping up and down and demonstrations, that's part of normal life. <laughs> and then Chinese oil workers started to get kidnapped, which was also a big surprise because they'd come in brotherly friendship. And suddenly they were kidnapped because certain sectors of Nigerian society saw them as exploitative just as they had seen the West as exploitative. So you know, all these strikes and things, we're not used to that in China. That's not the way we do things. And so in the end, what the Chinese uh, National Oil Company has done is it's employed Control Risk, Risks, which is a Western risk analysis company, to give them their background information, just like Shell or BP or any other company has has done. So I think that what we're seeing is in many ways that China sees itself reflects in Africa just as in the West we see ourselves reflects in Africa. We all see what we want to see and the what's missing to some extent in our analysis is what Africa, African people, African governments are going to get out of this new relationship with China. They've had a relationship with China over a long time but it's a new relationship now and I think that uh, that's one of the real issues, is that whether African people, African governments can have the same interests and whether, whether they can be assertive on a willing buyer, willing seller basis with China. It's a new relationship. It's a relationship which doesn't have the same old colonial baggage. So I'm just going to end here with a, a quote from Festus Mokai, who was, the, uh, was the, the leader of Botswana, who I interviewed um, a little while ago when there was the big... Um, big summit of African leaders in Beijing. And this is what he said to me. He said, China treats us as equals while the West treats us as former subjects. That is the reality. I prefer the attitude of China to that of the West. And he then burst out laughing and he said, there's bugger all I can do about it. <laughs>